Mr. Finchley Goes to Paris, adapted for radio by Andy and Eric Merriman from the book of the same name by Victor Canning. Episode 2, in which Mr. Finchley gains a guide, bumps into a friend and makes a move. Your drink, monsieur. Thank you. Would you like uh, some ice? Um, no, thank you. Are you enjoying your stay in Paris, monsieur? Well, I only arrived yesterday, but it seems as if I've been here much longer. Ah, then monsieur is already at home. Yes. As a matter of fact, I walked up a street which is very much like a road in Hampstead. That's where I live, in London. Nassington Avenue, actually. Ah. Is the cafe always this busy? Oh, every night is the same. But it is not always this noisy. Yes, what is going on on the other side of the square? A political meeting. Someone is speaking for this, for that, against this, against that. Oh, you know how it is. Oh, yes, we have a similar place at home. Curiously enough, it's called Speaker's Corner. Um, Mon Dieu! There goes another window. Um... Are we safe here? Yeah. Uh, perhaps. Perhaps not. Uh, I cannot say. Uh, we are used to it. Uh, this is always happening. W what's it all about, then? Who knows? Sometimes it is the communists, sometimes it is the fascists. And who is it tonight? Tonight, it seems to be both. Oh, this really is a bit much. After all, I came in here for a quiet drink. I, I think I'm leaving, if you don't mind. Of course, monsieur. I understand. But uh, please come back again sometime. Yes, although I'll wait until after the revolution. <laughs> Outside the cafe, it was pandemonium. The meeting had overflowed in a tangled, struggling mass of humanity. Market stalls were overturned, hawkers defended their goods, and hooligans seized the opportunity to hurl stones at cafe windows. As Mr Finchley stood transfixed amongst this carnage, a small boy broke away from a circle of struggling men. He dashed along the pavement, chased close behind by a broad-shouldered, angry-looking stallholder. Finchley knew that if caught, the boy would get no mercy for whatever had been his sin. He thus thrust out his foot and sent the man flying headfirst into an ironmongery stall. Finchley realised it would be unwise to dally in the neighbourhood. He duly left the square and turned into a quiet alleyway. Uh, 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 à voilà, monsieur. Merci beaucoup. Oh, 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 oh it's perfectly all right. Oh, you are English. Yeah. Monsieur is English. Mm. I'm also English. Oh. We're both English. Yeah. We're two English people together. Yeah. I'll tell you how English I am. London stands on the Thames. The Thames rises in the Cotswolds. The best cider is in Somerset. The best cheese in Cheshire. And the best drinking is in Flea Street. Uh, Fleet Street. Tell me, why, why was he chasing you? Because I saw this fish. Good gracious. Look here, you can't be English, otherwise you wouldn't have stolen that fish. But I wanted something to eat. It was lying on the ground with lots of other fish. I didn't think he'd mind, but he did. I'm sorry if I've done wrong, but I was hungry. When did you last eat? Earlier this morning, a roll. Oh, I see. A French breakfast. Mm. Well, in that case, let's get you something decent to eat. Now, put that headache down and follow me. Mm, that was delicious. Thank you. Do you want anything else? No, thank you. You're very kind to me. Are you my friend? I think you'll need a few friends if you're going to make a habit of stealing haddocks, young man. Oh, I won't do that again. Not now I know you don't like it. What's your name? Robert. Robert Gillespie. I'm ten years old. And I live with my guardian, Pepe Rivelle. But what about your parents? Oh, they're dead. That's why I live with Pepe. He looks after me. And what's your name, monsieur? Edgar Finchley. And where are you staying? At the Hotel Aquil. At the Hotel Aquil? Monsieur must be very rich. Oh, no, no, no. This is a business trip, and my firm in London are paying for the hotel. That's lucky. Mm. You see, I came over to see a man on legal business, but he's not here, so I've had to wait until he is, and then I'll return to England. I've never been to England, but I'll go one day. Oh, yes, of course you will. But now, it's getting late, and you should be going home. Where do you live? 
by the river near Cage de la Rappe. But I'll walk back with you. You'll do nothing of the sort at this time of night. We're a long way from the Seine in my hotel. I'll put you on the metro. But Paris is very interesting at night. I could repay your kindness by showing you all the things on the way. No, it's home for you. But I could easily... Robert, do as I say. Oh. Despite the boy's protests, Mr Finchley marched Robert to the nearest metro station and journeyed with him as far as he could before he had to change stations for his hotel. The next morning, Mr Finchley woke late and after a leisurely breakfast stood at the hotel entrance and lit his pipe. It was a warm golden day and the soft light from the sky filtered through the leafy trees to touch the grey stones of the street with mellow tints. He descended the steps and moved away up the pavement. He'd not gone far when he felt a tug at his arm and a familiar voice said... Bonjour, Mr Finchley. What? Did you sleep well? Peppy says that the world does not properly appreciate the blessing of sleep. Robert, what on earth are you doing here? I've been waiting for you. I discussed the matter with Pepe, and we decided that you've been so kind to me, I must repay you. Oh, really? There's no need to. I told Pepe that you're a stranger in Paris, and so you will need my services. Ah, ah, yes. So you wanted to be my guide, do you? If you'll allow me. Pepe said I wasn't to worry you, and that I must understand if you didn't want me. Yeah, well, I, 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 I hadn't really planned on this. So you don't want me? Oh, no, I didn't say that. It's just that... Oh, well, all right. You are engaged as my guide for today. Oh, thank you, monsieur. But there is one thing that worries me. What's that, monsieur? Well, even though we two are friends, I cannot allow you to give your services as a guide for nothing. What do you usually charge? Charge? Oh, yes. Mm, well, about five francs. That's what I usually charge. Excellent. Five francs for the morning and five francs for the afternoon. Oh, that's very generous, monsieur. Right. Well, that's settled. And now... Where would you like to see first? Well, I rather want to see the Louvre. Oh, no. You can't go and see the Louvre on a Sunday morning when it's so crowded. You must go during the week, when there are fewer people visiting. Oh, yeah. Perhaps you're right. How about Notre Dame? Um, it's being redecorated. Is it? But well, what about the Sacre Coeur? It's closed. But it's a church. And it's Sunday. Oh, well, as they over here, c'est la vie. Could we go to the Champs Elysees? Yes, but it's only an avenue. We should really have a proper place to visit. Well, all right, Robert. Where would you like to go? Oh, nowhere in particular. It's up to you. Do you like lifts? Lifts? Um, well, yes, but... Uh... Good. We'll go to the Arc de Triomphe. There's a lift there. We can go up in the lift to the top and you can see the whole of Paris. Right. Their itinerary decided, they set out, Mr Finchley clutching a guidebook and Robert bouncing happily at his side. Robert, what's the name of that church? The name of that church? Hmm. I'm afraid I don't... Could it be the Madeleine? Oh, yes, of course. That guidebook of yours is very helpful. Hmm. They turned into the Place de la Concorde and Finchley pointed to the tall Egyptian needle that dominated the centre of the place. And what is that? That? Um, well, that, monsieur, is... is a monument. Yes, that's right, it's a monument. And it was here that the riots recently... Oh, not more riots, surely. Yes, you should have seen the bloodshed. Pepe himself was injured in the fight. See, it was here that he fell and was rescued by his compatriots before the shooting began. He still got the tunic button of the guard he fought with. Really? Hmm. That's strange. My guidebook says it's an Egyptian obelisk and the oldest monument in Paris. Oh, dear. Does it? Mm. They turned up the Champs-Élysées. Up and down the road spun an endless succession of cars and along the pavements, under the shade of flowering chestnuts, walked a lively holiday throng. The gardens were fresh and coloured with blossom-loaded clumps of shrubs. The fountains sent great sprays and fans of misty water into the air iridescent moments of beauty that played a second in the sunshine and then dropped away in the breeze to wet the pavements. And still, Mr Finchley was thirsting for information. Is that the Grand Palais? Yes, that's right. Hmm. No, wait a minute, it can't be. 
Oh, let me have a look at my map. Yeah. It must be the Petite Palais. Or we've passed them both and it's the Palais de Glace. Which is it, Robert? Well, um, it's probably the, uh... Oh, look at that lovely car going by. The name of the palace. Does it matter? You've seen it. What does the name matter? Besides, there's a lift waiting for us. I want to know its name. You must understand that it's not possible for a guy to know everything. Now, there are hundreds of other places, and you've picked the one place I didn't know. The one place? Yes. Apart from this, I've been a good guide, haven't I? Hmm. Well, yes, I suppose so. And, of course, there are some questions that even the best guides can't answer. Perhaps you can tell me something. Yes? Are there streets like this in London? Oh, a few. But there are no cafes. No cafes? No, not outside, anyway. The weather, you know. In London, if we saw furniture on the pavement, we'd think someone was being evicted. <laughs> oh, very droll, Finchley. At the end of the Champs-Élysées, they finally came to the Arc de Triomphe. To Robert's great disappointment, the lift was out of order, and so they were forced to make a long climb to the top. Uh, uh, I think I'd better sit down now. Oh, but look at the view. Uh, Isn't it breathtaking? Oh, I'm afraid I've very little breath left to take, but yes, Robert, it's quite magnificent. Look, there's the Eiffel Tower. Oh, well. Done, Robert. Even you couldn't fail to recognise that. And from this parapet, you can see even more. Oh, Robert, do be careful. You're getting too close to the edge. Don't worry. I've done this before. Robert, what are you doing? For goodness sake, don't lean over the parapet. It's all right. Now watch this, monsieur. <laughs> Robert! Mr Finchley was justly shocked. Expectoration is not a pleasant habit. But small boys seldom have a great deal of respect for conventions, and they find it hard to restrain the instinctive urge which great heights demand of them. For them, there is something tragically beautiful in the slow curve and quickening drop. There was no ill will in Robert. He intended no harm towards any pedestrian. In fact, the wind dissipated his spittle into a fine spray long before it reached the ground. Mr. Finchley was, however, in no frame of mind to seek any justification for Robert, and neither was the uniformed attendant, who approached in a state of fury. Qu'est-ce que vous faites, vous, le petit? Il vous appartient. Robert, what does he say? Go on, Monsieur. I think we ought to leave. Yes, for once, I think you're right. I'm very sorry. I shouldn't have done that. No, you should not. I thought you were an English boy and knew how to behave. It was a terrible thing to do. Yes, all right, all right, all right. Just don't keep waving your arms about telling me how sorry you are. But I am. You're right to be angry. I feel awful. Oh, well, don't say anything more about it. Let's forget the whole affair. It's too fine a day to be bad-tempered. I agree. What would you like to do next? Well, I'm hot and tired and hungry. Then why don't we have some food in the Bois de Boulogne? Oh, is it far? Oh, no. It's very near. Good. Do you know, for one terrible moment, I thought you were going to say it's within spitting distance. <laughs> After lunch, Finchley suggested that they take a rowing boat out on the lake. Robert sat in the stern, gripping the rudder, whilst Finchley took the oars. Over the water moved other craft and a few swans propelling themselves out of the way of boats with an air of resentment at this human intrusion. They had not gone far when another boat drew up. In it was a red-faced flabby man and a boy of about Robert's age, who suddenly leant over the side and shouted a stream of rapid French at them. Robert swiftly replied, and back came another volley from the French boy. What is it? What is it? He's saying that his father is a better rower than you are. Oh, and what did you say? I told him you were the best rower on the lake. And now they want to race us to the island. Oh, dear. I know you don't want to race, but I had to say that to defend your honour. Well, just pull away. They'll think you're afraid, but never mind. You must think of your dignity. Afraid? What are you talking about? I'm not afraid. Do you think I wouldn't beat him? You're very good, but the other man looks very good too. Oh, does he? I don't know. 
Looks a bit out of condition to me. It's already puffing and panting. Yes, I think we will race them and, and bother my dignity. The two boats jockeyed for position and then they were off. Mr Finchley dipped and pulled, swung and tugged, muttering to himself, in, out, in, out, in the manner of the more illustrious boat race crews. Before long, Finchley had taken the lead. He increased his strike rate and pulled further away. The race was won. Robert and Finchley congratulated each other and Hedy with success failed to watch where they were going. There was a sudden jar, a harsh scraping of wood and a loud cry as a young man who had been standing up in his boat to take photographs toppled backwards. Oh, no! oh hey, are you all right? Oh, oh yeah. yes, I think so. Oh, but luckily, it's quite shallow here. I say, I'm most terribly sorry about this. My goodness, I don't believe it. Lawrence Hume. Do you know this man? Yes, we met on the Cross Channel Ferry. I really am most terribly sorry about this. It was my fault for not steering the boat properly. Look, there's no point in fighting for the honour of having tipped me into the lake. Well, I must say you're being very decent about this accident. Oh, no, not at all. I'm sure you didn't mean to. Well, not consciously, anyway. Wasn't it Plato who said that people's souls are constantly seeking out one another? Well, I don't know about Plato, but it's useful to blame this accident on my soul rather than my clumsiness. Look, you really ought to change your clothes before you catch a death of cold. I'm not staying far from here, so it won't take long. Well, then, please let me pay a taxi for you. Oh, no, there's no need for that. We are lucky to have capsized such a good-tempered person. Listen, why don't you both join me later for a cup of tea? Oh, thank you. That'd be very nice. You'll find me at number five, Rue Chalgrin, just off the Avenue Foch. Right oh. I just hope my guide will be able to find it. Would you like another cup, Finchley? Oh, no, thank you. Well, you should be honoured that Madame Mignard has taken a liking to you. She doesn't usually serve tea to guests. Your landlady seems kinder than she looks. Oh, she's all right. But don't let Madame's generosity deceive you. She thinks that all travelling Englishmen have plenty of money. Oh. Still, she has to make a living. That's not too easy in France at the moment. Or indeed anywhere. Incidentally, I thought you were only staying in Paris for a couple of days. Ah, oh, well, the chap I've come here to see isn't arriving until Tuesday. Oh, so you've been able to do a bit of sightseeing. Yes, and they even acquired a guide. At least that's what uh, Robert calls himself. Where is he, by the way? I left him talking to the concierge. It seems as if he knows him. Come in. Ah, Madame Mignard. I have come to collect your tea tray. Uh, will Monsieur be staying for dinner? Uh, oh, no, no, I'm going back to my hotel. Oh! Which hotel is that? The Hotel Achille. Oh, la, la, the Hotel Achille. Monsieur must be a very rich man. People will keep saying that. No, I'm not rich, I assure you. I simply went there because it was recommended. But there are many cheaper places. Monsieur Hume, for example, does not waste money on hotel. He comes to me and is comfortable. And my charges are such that cannot be beaten anywhere in Paris. The food is first class and there is always hot water. Tell him it is so, Monsieur Hume, for you should not want a fellow Englishman to be robbed by the wretches who run the Paris Hotel. Uh, but um, Mr Finchley is only staying until Tuesday. Two days at the Akis! That is a lot of money. I have a room like this one to which Monsieur is welcome. Oh, 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 oh I don't know. After all, my client is paying the bill and... But um... surely you would not want to cause him unnecessary expense? Oh, no, 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 no. I'm a great believer in thrift. Then you must come here. It is all settled. Oh, is it? Uh, uh, well, I wouldn't want to offend you. Then don't. Oh, <laughs> all right, I'll come. Monsieur will be very happy here. Now I will get the room ready. Oh, and of course, you must have dinner here tonight. Oh, yes, of course. I must. Oh, I'm sorry if you've been rushed into this. It was my fault. Madame never lets the chance of a fresh lodger go by. And I must warn you that the water is frequently far from hot. <laughs> well, I suppose I'd better get back to the hotel and pack up my belongings. See you later. There seems to be everything. Thank you for helping me pack, Robert. This is such a magnificent room. I hope you'll be just as comfortable in your new place. I'm sure I will. And now, I think you'd better be getting back to Pepe. I shan't want a guide any more today. Oh, here's your ten francs. Thank you. And you were pleased with my services as a guide? Uh, well, I, uh, yes. But I'll tell you what, Robert. Let me give you a little present. 
As well as my ten francs. Yes. Here we are. I think you'd better have my guidebook. Come in. Hello, Finchley. Ah, Hume. Settling in all right? Yes, thanks. Good. Now, I came along to put you wise about the people in this place. Might be a bit of a shock for you otherwise. Good heavens, what's the matter with them? Well, nothing. Well, I mean, nothing to be worried about. It's merely that until you've got used to them, they might seem a little strange. Oh. There's five lodges, and they're all very different. Then there's the family. Now, you've met Madame. There's her husband. He's a doddery old army man. And, and her widowed daughter, who has a little girl, who you won't see because she's packed off to bed at six each night. Ah, oh, but I have seen the child. She was in the hall when I came back, and I suppose it was her mother with her. She seemed very young for a widow. Oh, then it wasn't Madame's daughter. That must have been Mari Peters, the child's governess. I forgot to mention her. Uh, she's English. I don't really know much about her. Oh, really? She's a very pretty girl, I remember. I was surprised that for so fair a girl, she should have such dark eyes, almost black. Oh, no, they're not black. Uh, they're, they're really a very deep blue, but they have a peculiar quality of appearing very dark, or almost black, sometimes. You seem to have made a study of them. Not at all. It's merely the observing habit which is bred in any capable naturalist. Oh, yes. Yes, you've got to be able to memorise the exact colours to be any good. And I merely notice the colour of her eyes, as I should notice the coloration of a butterfly's wings. And which do you prefer, butterflies or young women? Uh, butterflies, definitely. Mm. And I think I know why. You can't stick a pin through a woman and neatly label her as you can a butterfly. It needs more practice before you can handle and catalogue them properly. <laughs> <laughs> Dinner is served. The meal was typically French, and so was the conversation. Finchley, like a canard out of water, was battered and assaulted from all sides, and his head began to ache with all the effort of trying to catch at meanings. He was more than relieved when Madame Mignard finally rapped on the table and pronounced that dinner was over. Meanwhile, upstairs, Murray Peters locked the apartment door behind her and breathed a long sigh of relief. She was free of her duties for the evening, and as she pulled on her gloves, a feeling of exhilaration overcame her. She hitched up her skirt and, sitting upon the wide balustrade rail, began to slide down the stairs with increasing speed. In the hallway, Mr Finchley stopped at the foot of the stairs and bent down to light his pipe, unaware of the menace that was hurtling towards him. Look out! What? I can't stop! Out of the way! Oh! Oh! oh. 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 That was lucky. You broke my fall. Oh, do you mind? You're sitting on my chest. I'm so sorry. I didn't see you until it was too late. Well, I must say it was a bit of a surprise. That's because you weren't listening to me. I did try and warn you. And now you're going to be angry with me. No, it's all right. I'm not hurt. Oh, please don't worry about it. Are you sure? I could kick myself for being so clumsy. Oh, no, no, don't do that. There's no point in both of us being hurt. By the way, I'm Edgar Finchley, and you must be Marie Peters. Yes. How did you know? It's the eyes. <laughs> yeah, and I've heard all about you. Oh, here... Let me help you up. Thank you. Oh. You see, I get so carried away sometimes. I think I'm skiing or, or going down a toboggan run. Is that the way you usually come downstairs, then? Only when it's my night off. Oh. I'm just so glad to get away that I have to do something to celebrate. Besides, half the fun of sliding down the banisters is not knowing who you're going to bump into. Hello, what's happened? Ah, uh, well, you, you see, uh, I, I, um... Just a little accident. Miss Peters and I, uh, we, we, well, we got in each other's way. Now, don't tell me. She was sliding down the banisters. I had the privilege of watching her perform the other evening. You did? I did. I admired your skill. But I felt that sooner or later you would certainly have an accident. Oh, it's easy to be wise after the event. Anyway, what were you doing watching me? I just happened to be passing. Or should I say, you just happened to be passing. And I suppose you've never slid down a banister in your life. Uh, no, I haven't, as a matter of fact. Mm. I didn't think so. You're not the type. Well, I seem to remember that I was very good at it once. 
Look, why don't we all go out somewhere and have a drink? Oh, no, I don't think so. I... Well, this is my first night at Madame Mignard's, and I want to make the most of it. I was actually on my way to the pictures. And I've got some work to do. Oh, come on, you two. I think this meeting was meant to be. You see, I bumped into Hume, and Miss Peters bumped into me. It's obviously not just a coincidence. After all, wasn't it, um... Yeah, Plato, that said people's souls are constantly seeking one another out? In episode two of Mr Finchley Goes to Paris by Victor Canning, Richard Griffiths played the part of Mr Finchley, Jacqueline Tong was Madame Mignard, James Cohen was Robert Gillespie, Serena Evans was Murray Peters, Piers Gibbon was Lawrence Hume, and Keith Anderson was the waiter. The narrator was James Villers. Mr Finchley Goes to Paris was adapted for radio by Andy and Eric Merriman and the producer was Gareth Edwards. Thank you.